So what I wanted to do today is start the long process of going through Plato's Republic. I want to read the whole thing, or I, I think in this case we're going to listen to the whole thing, and I want to do a guided reading. So essentially, we're going to read the text together. Actually, I'm going to play uh, the LibriVox version of the text, and anytime there's something that's worth noting, uh, anytime there's something that, was, um, that I might have some insight on from the studies that I've done, I'm going to share it. So by the end, um, we'll have gone through the whole book, and hopefully, if you follow me from beginning to end, uh, we'll both understand it a whole lot better. So what we're going to do is we're going to listen to the LibriVox version, which is the Benjamin Jowett version, which I have right here in my hand. It's not necessarily the best translation of the text, but it is the translation that is free. And I can't play the other ones because uh, I'm not sure what the copyright situation is on those. So I've got this right in front of me. I also have the Bloom text, and we can, we can ref reference that as well if we have any questions. So we're going to listen, and we're going to talk, and hopefully it will be a good situation. So I'm going to start the audio, and this is, again, the Benjamin Jowett translation of Plato's Republic. The Republic by Plato Translated by Benjamin Jowett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bob Neufeld Persons of the Dialogue Socrates, who is the narrator Glaucon, Adamantus, Polemarchus, Cephalus, Thrasymachus, and Clitophon and others who are mute auditors. The scene is laid in the house of Cephalus at the Piraeus, and the whole dialogue is narrated by Socrates, the day after it actually took place, to Timaeus, Hermocrates, Critias, and a nameless person, who are introduced in the Timaeus. Book One I went down yesterday to the Piraeus with Glaucon, the son of Ariston, that I might offer up my prayers to the goddess, and also because I wanted to see in what manner they would celebrate the festival, which was a new thing. All right, so I'm already interrupting, but this is really important. The beginning of this book is really important, and to understand it, we have to uh, look into it. So with a lot of books that Plato wrote, the actual first word that comes up in the book is significant. And um, this one is, I went down, which in Greek I think is kata bino, which is... Um, well, not really important, but going down here is is key when we're looking at this book. Because later on, when we get to book seven, we're going to be seeing the allegory of the cave. And the whole book kind of revolves around this allegory that Socrates himself is going down into the, the world that he's trying to influence he's he's going down and he's trying to raise people up out of uh out of their ignorance and out of their the ways that they're set in so when we get to book seven we'll talk about this a little bit more but rem just remember anytime you're reading plato um the first words of the book are actually significant to what the book is going to be about so that word is important and keep in mind as we keep reading I was delighted with the procession of the inhabitants, but that of the Thracians was equally, if not more, beautiful. When we had finished our prayers and viewed the spectacle, we turned in the direction of the city, and at that instant Polemarchus, the son of Cephalus, chanced to catch sight of us from a distance as we were starting on our way home, and told his servant to run and bid us wait for him. The servant took hold of me by the cloak behind, and said, Polemarchus desires you to wait. I turned round and asked him where his master was. There he is, said the youth, coming after you, if you will only wait. Certainly we will, said Glaucon, and in a few minutes Polemarchus appeared, and with him Atamantus, Glaucon's brother, Nicaratus, the son of Nicaeus, and several others who had been at the procession. Polemarchus said to me, I perceive, Socrates, that you and your companion are already on your way to the city. You are not far wrong, I said. But do you see, he rejoined, how many we are? Of course. 
and are you stronger than all these? For if not, you will have to remain where you are. May there not be an alternative, I said, that we may persuade you to let us go? But can you persuade us if we refuse to listen to you? he said. Certainly not, replied Glaucon. Then we are not going to listen. Of that you may be assured. All right, this is another really important part. Again, these themes in the beginning of the book are going to be significant as we read through. But right now, this little section where they're basically, I mean, this is all a joke to them, but they're all, they're saying, Socrates, come to uh, this place. This is actually the place where the dialogue is going to occur. And Socrates is like, well, you know, what if I don't want to? And basically, uh, Glaucon or Adamantius says, well, we're stronger than you. We've got a whole bunch of people and we're stronger, so we can make you do it if we want. And this actually harkens back to a scene from the uh, Peloponnesian War, actually. Now, I really don't know the details, but you can look it up. Um, there was a, an island, a group of people who uh, refused to uh, ally themselves with the Athenians and refused to help. And basically, Athens is like, well, we're just going to kind of make you do it or we're, we'll kill you. And it turns out that they just ended up killing them. And the, the quote that comes from that is, the strong do what they will, and the weak suffer what they must. And this is the idea that Socrates is going to be fighting against throughout this whole dialogue. This idea that strength is all that matters, and that if you have enough strength, that you're actually going to be happy and successful, which, um, which is not what they're going to be arguing for. But this little mini, um, this, this situation where they're leading off into the dialogue is sort of giving you an advance notice of what the dialogue is going to be about. It's going to be about this idea of, of strength and uh, power and if it is sufficient for happiness. And of course, the dialogue itself is about justice, and that's going to come up as well. But just realize that, that this, these sections in the beginning um, are really giving us hints as to what the whole dialogue is going to be about. But don't be confused. This isn't a, um, a serious thing. No one's actually threatening anyone here. Uh, it's sort of more of a, a thing that's happening in jest. So Socrates is going to agree to go back, and they're going to have the dialogue proper in the house of uh, Cephalus, or however you end up pronouncing that word. Adamantus added, Has no place told you of the torch race on horseback in honor of the goddess which will take place in the evening? With horses, I replied, that is a novelty. Will horsemen carry torches and pass them one to another during the race? Yes, said Polymarchus, and not only so, but a festival will be celebrated at night, which you certainly ought to see. Let us rise soon after supper and see this festival. There will be a gathering of young men, and we will have a good talk. Stay then, and do not be perverse. Glaucon said, I suppose, since you insist, that we must. Very good, I replied. Accordingly, we went with Polymarchus to his house, and there we found his brothers, Lysias and Ethodemus, and with them Trasimachus the Chalcedonian, Carmantides the Paean, and Clytophon the son of Aristonymus. There, too, was Cephalus, the father of Polymarchus, whom I had not seen for a long time, and I thought him very much aged. He was seated on a cushioned chair, and had a garland on his head, for he had been sacrificing in the court. And there were some other chairs in the room, arranged in a semicircle, upon which we sat down by him. He saluted me eagerly, and then he said, I uh, just want to interrupt here this uh, conversation with Cephalus. This is an old man, and this conversation is going to lead into the conversation that the whole book is about on justice. And we should be contrasting Cephalus, who is not exactly in the framework of mind to be having this debate. In fact, he, as soon as he gets pressed on something, he kind of just pieces out, he goes away, and leaves the argument to these younger people. Um, but think about how justice is portrayed in this early section of Republic Book One, and uh, watch for its development as we move forward. You don't come to see me, Socrates, as often as you ought. If I were still able to go and see you, I would not ask you to come to me, but 
at my age i can hardly get to the city and therefore you should come oftener to the piraeus for let me tell you that the more the pleasures of the body fade away the greater to me is the pleasure and charm of conversation do not then deny my request but make our house your resort and keep company with these young men we are old friends and you will be quite at home with us i replied there is nothing which for my part i like better cephalus than conversing with aged men for i regard them as travellers who have gone on a journey which i too may have to go and of whom i ought to inquire whether the way is smooth and easy or rugged and difficult and this is a question which i should like to ask of you who have arrived at that time which the poets call the threshold of old age all right so they're going to talk about um Cephalus, who's an old man they're going to talk about uh how whether or not age is you know easy or hard and that's going to be significant because it's talking about some of the things that are going to come up later particularly your relationship with the gods he's going to say i'm an old man but i, I haven't had to do anything really bad in my life therefore i'm not really afraid of what's going to happen when i die and that's going to come up later when they're talking about justice and whether it's important to be just so that you don't end up um, going to hades or a negative place when you die and yeah is life harder towards the end or what report do you give of it i will tell you socrates he said what my own feeling is men of my age flock together we are birds of a feather as the old proverb says and at our meetings the tale of my acquaintance commonly is i cannot eat i cannot drink the pleasures of youth and love are fled away there was a good time once but now that is gone and life is no longer life some complain of the slights which are put upon them by relations and they will tell you sadly of how many evils their old age is the cause but to me socrates these complainers seem to blame that which is not really in fault for if old age were the cause i too being old and every other old man would have felt as they do but this is not my own experience nor that of others whom i have known how well i remember the aged poet sophocles when in answer to the question how does love suit with age sophocles are you still the man you were peace he replied most gladly have i escaped the thing of which you speak i feel as if i had escaped from a mad and furious master this isn't super relevant to the rest of the dialogue but i do i do really like this this part because as an old person there's lots to complain about right you're you're in pain and in this in this situation they're talking about how you're not um you know prone to having sex and doing that sort of thing and some people can see that as a negative but cephalus here is actually construing that as a positive thing as um as we all know that that sort of those sort of drives are often a distraction to people and when they go away you actually have more time to spend on things that might be more lastingly important and i think that's what he's getting at with this sophocles quote where he's saying you know i've escaped this mad and furious master the desires and and the um the lusts of your body are um well, at a time where they die away it's actually sort of a relief his words have often occurred to my mind since and they seem as good to me now as at the time when he uttered them for certainly old age has a great sense of calm and freedom when the passions relax their hold then as sophocles says we are freed from the grasp not of one mad master only but of many the truth is socrates that these regrets and also the complaints about relations are to be attributed to the same cause which is not old age but men's characters and tempers for he who is of a calm and happy nature will hardly feel the pressure of age but to him who is of an opposite disposition youth and age are equally a burden i listened in admiration and wanting to draw him out that he might go on yes cephalus i said 
but I rather suspect that people in general are not convinced by you when you speak thus. They think that old age sits lightly upon you, not because of your happy disposition, but because you are rich, and wealth is well known to be a great comforter. All right, so here we have Socrates pushing back on the old man, and we're going to see that he's not really up for the sort of debate that Socrates wants to have, but he does uh, humor him for a little while, but as soon as he gets pressed very hard, he kind of goes away. But this is a foreshadowing of the sort of discussion we're going to be having in the future. You are right, he replied. They are not convinced, and there is something in what they say. Not, however, so much as they imagine. I might answer them as Themistocles answered the Seriphian, who was abusing him, and saying that he was famous not for his own merits, but because he was an Athenian. If you had been a native of my country, or I of yours, neither of us would have been famous. And to those who are not rich and are impatient of old age, the same reply may be made. For to the good poor man old age cannot be a light burden, nor can a bad rich man ever have peace with himself. May I ask, Cephalus, whether your fortune was for the most part inherited or acquired by you? Acquired, Socrates. Do you want to know how much I acquired? In the art of making money I have been midway between my father and grandfather, for my grandfather whose name I bear, doubled and trebled the value of his patrimony, that which he inherited being much what I possess now. But my father, Lysanias, reduced the property below what it is at present, and I shall be satisfied if I leave to these my sons not less but a little more than I had received. That was why I asked you the question, I replied, because I see that you are indifferent about money, which is a characteristic rather of those who have inherited their fortunes than of those who have acquired them. The makers of fortunes have a second love of money as a creation of their own, resembling the affection of authors for their own poems, or of parents for their children, besides that natural love of it, for the sake of use and profit which is common to them and all men. And hence they are very bad company for they can talk about nothing but the praises of wealth. That is true, he said. Yes, that is very true. But may I ask you another question? What do you consider to be the greatest blessing which you have reaped from your wealth? One, he said, of which I could not expect easily to convince others. For let me tell you, Socrates, that when a man thinks himself to be near death, fears and cares into into his mind which he never had before the tales of a world all right pay attention here this is um going to come up again later in book two and or is it three it'll come up later we'll see it and uh this idea that people that do good and have no reason to fear death is going to be one of the arguments that's used against socrates and his um, in his argument for justice because he's basically they're basically saying to him that people really only want to be good to avoid punishment so if the gods are going to punish you when you die well of course you're going to be good but that's um, that's something that Socrates is going to be arguing against so pay attention here lo and the punishment which is exacted there of deeds done here were once a laughing matter to him but now he is tormented with the thought that they may be true either from the weakness of age or because he is now drawing near to that other place he has a clearer view of these things suspicions and alarms crowd thickly upon him and he begins to reflect and consider what wrongs he has done to others and when he finds that the sum of his transgressions is great he will many a time like a child start up in his sleep for fear and he is filled with dark forebodings but to him who is conscious of no sin, sweet hope, as Pindar charmingly says, is the kind nurse of his age. Hope, he says, cherishes the soul of him who lives in justice and holiness, and is the nurse of his age and the companion of his journey. Hope which is mightiest to sway the restless soul of man. How admirable are his words, and the great blessing of riches, 
I do not say to every man, but to a good man, is that he has had no occasion to deceive or to defraud others, either intentionally or unintentionally, and when he departs to the world below, he is not in any apprehension about offerings due to the gods or debts which he owes to men. Now, to this... All right, so um, this is one of the arguments that uh, we're going to see later. If you have money and if you're able to propitiate the gods, right, if you're able to give them stuff and you've never really had a reason to steal anything or if you've never had a reason to be unjust, then you're going to be sort of... Um, less worried about the afterlife than someone who has. Peace of mind, the possession of wealth greatly contributes, <laughs> and therefore I say that setting one thing against another, of the many advantages which wealth has to give to a man of sense, this is, in my opinion, the greatest. Well said, Cephalus, I replied, but as concerning justice, what is it? All right, to speak the, the truth and to pay your debts, no more than this. And All right, so Socrates is coming against this idea that Cephalus was speaking. Uh, what is justice? And he says, to speak the truth and pay your debts, is that it? Um, and we're going to find out that that's not what it is. Even to this are there not exceptions. Suppose that a friend, when in his right mind, has deposited arms with me and he asks for them when he is not in his right mind. Ought I to give them back to him? No one would say that I ought, or that I should be right in doing so, any more than they would say that I ought always to speak the truth to one who is in his condition. All right, this is going to come up later, but the question is, um, if, if let's just say someone gives you, um, let's use a modern example, a gun, and it says, look after this gun for me. And then they come back to you, and they're all worked up. You know, maybe they're drunk, or they're real angry, or you could tell that there's something wrong with them, and they say, I need my gun, give me my gun. Um, is it just to give it back to them? Because if your definition of justice is to pay your debts, um, then you'd be like, yeah, sure, take it. But we know that that's not the case. Um, so Socrates is going to reject this, uh, this definition of justice, and... The rest of the book is going to be on finding out the proper definition. You are quite right, he replied. But then, I said, speaking the truth and paying your debts is not a correct definition of justice. Quite correct, Socrates, if Simonides is to be believed, said Polemarchus, interposing. I fear, said Cephalus, that I must go now, right, for I have to look leaves. after the sacrifices and I hand over the argument to Polemarchus and the company. "'Is not Polemarchus your heir?' I said. "'To be sure,' he answered, and went away, laughing to the sacrifices. "'Tell me, then, O thou heir—' So the, just the attitude of Cephalus here, it's, he's not super um, into it, you know, he's just kind of, he's laughing about it, it's no big deal. And we're left with the interlocutors that we're going to be having— for the rest of the dialogue, Glaucon and Adamantius for most of the dialogue, and we'll see Thrasymachus coming in uh, pretty soon to kind of establish the the premise that we're going to be talking about. Of the arguments, what did Simonides say, and according to you truly say, about justice? He said that the repayment of a debt is just, and in saying so he appears to me to be right. I should be sorry to doubt the word of such a wise and inspired man, but his meaning, though probably clear to you, is the reverse of clear to me. For he certainly does not mean, as we were just now saying, that I ought to return a deposit of arms or of anything else to one who asks for it when he is not in his right senses, and yet a deposit cannot be denied to be a debt. True. Then, when the person who asks me is not in his right mind, I am by no means to make the return? Certainly not. When Simonides said that the repayment of a debt was justice, he did not mean to include that case. Oh, certainly not, for he thinks that a friend ought always to do good to a friend, and never evil. You All right, just a little kind of peek into Socratic dialogue. Um, Socrates is always going to be doing this, so we have this example of what justice might be saying. We have this, this example from Simonides, which is the repayment of debts. 
And what he's going to do is he's going to ask questions that indicate there's a flaw in the reasoning. So he says, well, of course, Simonides didn't mean that we're supposed to repay our debts when someone's asking for a gun when they're, when they're clearly out of their mind. So he's kind of dismantling the argument, he's dismantling what Simonides is saying, whether or not that's even what Simonides meant at the time. A lot of these quotes are kind of taken out of whatever context that they're in. You mean that the return of a deposit of gold, which is to the injury of the receiver, if the two parties are friends, is not the repayment of a debt? That is what you would imagine him to say? Yes. And are enemies also to receive what we owe to them? To be sure, he said. They are to receive what we owe them, and an enemy, as I take it, owes to an enemy that which is due or proper to him, that is to say, evil. Simonides, then, after the manner of poets, would seem to have spoken darkly of the nature of justice. For he really meant to say that justice is the giving to each man what is proper to him, and this he termed a debt. That must have been his meaning, he said. By heaven, I replied, and if we asked him what due or proper thing is given by medicine, and to whom, what answer do you think that he would make to us? All right, this is another Socrates, this is another platonic device. Uh, he's basically going to compare this idea of debts to another thing. In this case, it's medicine. But throughout the dialogue, we get examples of all sorts of things, different trades, uh, a, guy, a guy that's a, sh a captain of a ship. And he's going to say, well, if it doesn't work here, it's not going to work here. And a lot of times it's really helpful to have these illustrations, but you also be on the lookout of times where the connection isn't one-to-one. -one. So it's not always going to be a perfect analogy. And sometimes there are actually logical flaws in the analogy. But uh, this is how uh, Socrates made his way through this argument. He would surely reply that medicine gives drugs and meat and drink to human bodies. <laughs> And what due or proper thing is given by cookery, and to what? Seasoning to food. And what is that which justice gives, and to whom? If, Socrates, we are to be guided at all by the analogy of the preceding instances, then justice is the art which gives good to friends and evil to enemies. That is his meaning, then? I think so. And who is best able to do good to his friends and evil to his enemies in time of sickness? The physician. Or when they are on a voyage amid the perils of the sea? The pilot. And in what sort of actions, or with a view to what results, is the just man most able to do harm to his enemy and good to his friend? In going to war against the one and in making alliances with the other? All right, so here he's getting at this idea that justice is not very powerful, right? So if you want to, like, actually do something, then you're going to need a person who's good at that thing. So if you're talking about medicine, you're going to need a physician. If you're going to want to sail across the, sh the, the sea, you're going to want a captain. So he's like, well, what's, what good is a just man if justice really doesn't do much? Um, and that'll be another one of the problems of this definition, that justice doesn't have a lot of application. But when a man is well, my dear Polymarchus, there is no need of a physician. No. And he who is not on a voyage has no need of a pilot. No. Then in time of peace, justice will be of no use. I am very far from thinking so. You think that justice may be of use in peace as well as in war? Yes. Like husbandry for the acquisition of corn. Yes. Or like shoemaking for the acquisition of shoes, that is what you mean? Yes. And what similar use or power of acquisition has justice in time of peace? In contracts, Socrates, justice is of use. And by contracts you mean partnerships? Exactly. But is the just man or the skillful player a more useful and better partner at the game of drafts? The skillful player. And in the laying of bricks and stones, is the just man a more useful or better partner than the builder? Oh, quite the reverse. Then in what sort of partnership is the just man a better partner than the harp player? As in playing the harp, the harp player is certainly a better partner than the just man. In a money partnership. Yes, pa 
Okay, so now we're just getting that the fact that a, ju- a just man's going to be better as it pertains to money, and Socrates is going to pull this apart as well by saying essentially, you know, justice is only good when you're not doing anything. You know, if you have money sitting in a bank, then you want a just man so that he doesn't steal your money. But otherwise, it's not very good. And of course, that's not what Socrates believes, but he's dismantling the arguments of here Simonides and later Thrasymachus. Hello, Marcus. But surely not in the use of money, for you do not want a just man to be your counsellor in the purchase or sale of a horse. A man who is knowing about horses would be better for that, would he not? Certainly. And when you want to buy a ship, the shipwright or the pilot would be better. True. Then what is that joint use of silver or gold in which the just man is to be preferred? When you want a deposit to be kept safely. You mean when money is not wanted, but allowed to lie. Precisely. That is to say, justice is useful when money is useless. That is the inference. And when you want to keep a pruning hook safe, then justice is useful to the individual and to the state. But when you want to use it, then the art of the vine dresser. Clearly. And when you want to keep a shield or a lyre and not to use them, you would say that justice is useful. But when you want to use them, then the art of the soldier or of the musician. Certainly. And so, of all other things, justice is useful when they are useless, and useless when they are useful. That is the inference. Then justice is not good for much. But let us consider this further point. Is not he who can... All right, here I'm just going to uh, pre, you know, prime you for this next argument. He's basically saying that the, those who are good at something are also good at messing it up, right? Um, so if you're good at boxing, you're going to be good at not only defending yourself against blows, but you're going to be good at hitting people. And if you're a physician, you know how to prevent diseases, but you also would know how to cause a disease if you wanted to do that. So he's arguing here that the definition that they're discussing is actually that the just man is the best at doing injustice as well. Best strike a blow in a (coughs) boxing match or in any kind of fighting, best able to ward off a blow, certainly, and he who is most skillful in preventing or escaping from a disease is best able to create one. True. And he is the best guard of a camp who is best able to steal a march upon the enemy. Well, certainly. Then he who is a good keeper of anything is also a good thief? Well, that, I suppose, is to be inferred. Then, if the just man is good at keeping money, he is good at stealing it. That is implied in the argument. Then, after all, the just man has turned out to be a thief. And this is a lesson which I suspect you must have learnt out of Homer. For he, speaking of Atolia, uh, just let, let's bring up Homer. Let's just let's just talk about that for a second. A lot of this conversation is going to be talking about the poets, particularly uh, the epic poet Homer, and sort of the worldview that he created in Greece. Homer was very influential in this time, and Homer is one of these people that would probably be argued to have uh, a lot of emphasis on strength and power rather than virtue. And so he's talking to a bunch of Greeks who are influenced by Homer. So you'll see a lot of what he's doing as he's building up his own philosophies. He's actually breaking down the philosophies that have been established by Homer and by the other poets who talk about the gods. Because the maternal grandfather of Odysseus, who is a favorite of his, affirms that he was excellent above all men in theft and perjury. And so... You and Homer and Simonides are agreed that justice is an art of theft, to be practiced, however, for the good of friends and for the harm of enemies. That was what you were saying? No, certainly not that, though I do not know now what I did say, but I still stand by the latter words. Well, there is another question. By friends and enemies, do we mean those who are so really, or only in seeming? Surely, he said, A man may be expected to love those whom he thinks good, and to hate those whom he thinks evil. Yes, but do not persons often err about good and evil? Many who are not good seem to be so, and conversely. That is true. 
then to them the good will be enemies and the evil will be their friends true and in that case they will be right in doing good to the evil and evil to the good clearly but the good are just and would not do an injustice true then according to your argument it is just to injure those who do no wrong nay socrates the doctrine is immoral then i suppose that we ought to do good to the just and harm to the unjust i like that better but see the consequence many all right so here they're they're kind of refining the argument uh refining the definition of justice to uh doing a good to the just and harm to the unjust and the consequence is going to be that we don't really know who's good and who's bad and um oftentimes those those categories may even shift so by doing uh by, by being just in this case you actually have this chance of doing evil to a good person or uh, doing good to an evil person and this is just more along the lines of uh, refuting the argument that simonides and here polymarchus is uh, suggesting a man who is ignorant of human nature has friends who are bad friends and in that case he ought to do harm to them and he has good enemies whom he ought to benefit but if so we shall be saying the very opposite of that which we affirmed to be the meaning of simonides very true he said and i think that we had better correct an error into which we seem to have fallen in the use of the words friend and enemy what was the error polemarchus i asked we assumed that he is a friend who seems to be or who is thought good and how is the error to be corrected we should rather say that he is a friend who is as well as seems good and that he who seems only and is not good only seems to be and is not a friend and of an enemy the same may be said you would argue that the good are our friends and the bad our enemies yes and instead of saying simply as we did this is also important the good are our friends the bad are our enemies keep that in mind and at first that it is just to do good to our friends and harm to our enemies we should further say it is just to do good to our friends when they are good and harm to our enemies when they are evil yes that appears to me to be the truth but ought the just to injure any one at all undoubtedly he ought to injure those who are both wicked and his enemies when horses are injured are they improved or deteriorated the latter deteriorated that is to say in the good qualities of horses not of dogs yes of horses and dogs are deteriorated in the good qualities of dogs and not of horses of course all right this could be confusing um, because we don't really talk like this anymore. But what he's doing is he's s basically taking these categories and saying that when they're improved or deteriorated, when they're made worse, they're, they're deteriorated in that way. So a horse that's worse is going to be uh, maybe a, a worse runner, maybe a worse carrier of things. A dog that's worse might be you know, worse at guarding stuff. And he uses other examples later in the book about eyes and ears. And, you know, bad eye is going to be one that sees things less uh, acutely. And that is going to be linked to justice here uh, in just a second. And I will talk about that when it happens. Of course. And will not men who are injured be deteriorated in that which is the proper virtue of man? Certainly. And that human virtue is justice, to be sure. Okay, so this is one of those examples, uh, like I was talking about earlier, where the logic doesn't really carry through. It's really interesting, but it's probably not going to be super helpful. Um, he's basically saying that if you hurt a man, um, it says, will not men who are injured be deteriorated in that which is the proper virtue of man? Yes, and that human virtue is justice. So he's saying that if you hurt a person, they're going to become less just, which doesn't really play out in reality. Um, and of course, this is a refutation of another point, so this may not be his actual beliefs, but just be aware, like I was saying earlier, not every single one of these analogies is, is perfectly logically sound.
then men who are injured are of necessity made unjust. That is the result. But can the musician by his art make men unmusical? Well, certainly not. Or the horseman by his art make them bad horsemen? Impossible. And can the just by justice make men unjust? Or, speaking generally, can the good by virtue make them bad? Oh, assuredly not. Any more than heat can produce cold, it cannot, or drought moisture. Clearly not. So he's just saying here that good things cannot produce bad. So a justice, a just person can't harm, uh, can't make someone worse. It will always be improving people. Nor can the good harm anyone. Impossible. And the just is the good, certainly. Then to injure a friend or anyone else is not the act of a just man, but of the opposite, who is the unjust. I think that what you say is quite true, Socrates. That if a man says that justice consists in the repayment of debts, and that good is the debt which a just man owes to his friends, and evil the debt which he owes to his enemies, to say this is not wise. For it is not true, if, as has been clearly shown, the injuring of another can be in no case just. I agree with you, said Polymarchus. Then you and I are prepared to take up arms against any one who attributes such a saying to Simonides, or Bias, or Pittacus, or any other wise man or seer. I am quite ready to do battle at your side, he said. Shall I tell you whose I believe the saying to be? Whose? I believe that Periander, or Perdicus, or Xerxes, or Asmenius the Theban, or some other rich and mighty man, who had a great opinion of his own power, was the first to say that justice is doing good to your friends and harm to your enemies. Most true, he said. Yes, I said, but if this definition of justice also breaks down, what other can be offered? All right, so here is the end of this section. So we've gone from Cephalus to Polymarchus, and now they basically, I mean, the dialogue could end here, right? Okay, we've agreed that it's not this, and they're all agreeing, everyone's kind of happy, and in comes Thrasymachus, and he's going to throw a wrench in everything. His view of justice is going to be quite different, and uh, he's going to see justice as an evil, as a bad thing, and that unjust people are actually better if they're not caught, if they're not punished for their unjust deeds. So Thrasymachus is coming in, and there's some funny stuff in the beginning about how he's, you know, so scary in his anger. Um, but listen, and, and his points will come up. Um, it'll take a little while, so we're going to listen, and we'll, I'll interrupt when need be. Several times in the course of the discussion, Thrasymachus had made an attempt to get the argument into his own hands, and had been put down by the rest of the company, who wanted to hear the end. But when Polymarchus and I had done speaking, and there was a pause, he could no longer hold his peace, and gathering himself up, he came at us like a wild beast, seeking to devour us. We were quite panic-stricken at the sight of him. He roared out to the whole company, "'What folly, Socrates, has taken possession of you all, and why, silly billies, do you knock under to one another? I say that if you want really to know what justice is, you should not only ask, but answer, and you should not seek honour to yourself from the refutation of an opponent, but have your own answer. For there is many a one who can ask and cannot answer. And now I will not have you say that justice is duty, or advantage, or profit, or gain, or interest, for this sort of nonsense will not do for me. I must have clearness and accuracy." I was panic-stricken at his words, and could not look at him without trembling. Indeed, I believe that if I had not fixed my eye upon him, I should have been struck dumb. But when I saw his fury rising, I looked at him first, and was therefore able to reply to him. I think this is sarcastic. Thrasymachus, I said, with a quiver, don't be hard upon us. Polymarchus and I may have been guilty of a little mistake in the argument, but I can assure you that the error was not intentional. If we were seeking for a piece of gold, you would not imagine that we were knocking under to one another, and so losing our chance of finding it. And why, when we are seeking for justice, 
a thing more precious than many pieces of gold, do you say that we are weakly yielding to one another, and not doing our utmost to get at the truth? Nay, my good friend, we are— This is another thing um, that comes up regularly in Plato, uh, particularly in the dialogues that kind of lead up to his execution. They, you know, the idea of wisdom— uh, in this case, talking about justice, but the idea of understanding virtue and being wise, and this sort of dialectic where you're talking back and forth and trying to learn, he 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 sees this as like the most important thing. There's really nothing more important in his mind than this sort of activity, which is why he's willing to die for it. Are most willing and anxious to do so, but the fact is that we cannot. And if so. You people who know all things should pity us, and not be angry with us. How characteristic of Socrates, he replied, with a bitter laugh. <laughs> That's your ironical style. Did I not foresee, have I not already told you, that whatever he was asked he would refuse to answer, and try irony or any other shuffle, in order that he might avoid answering? People get mad at Socrates throughout all these books for... Uh, either being ironic or for not answering questions, but only asking questions. You are a philosopher, Thrasymachus, I replied, and well know that if you ask a person what numbers make up twelve, taking care to prohibit him whom you ask from answering twice six, or three times four, or six times two, or four times three, for this sort of nonsense will not do for me, then obviously, if that is your way of putting the question, no one can answer you. But suppose that he were to retort, Thrasymachus, what do you mean? If one of these numbers which you interdict be the true answer to the question, am I falsely to say some other number which is not the right one? Is that your meaning? How would you answer him? Just as if the two cases were at all alike, he said. But why should they not be? I replied. And even if they are not, but only appear to be so to the person who is asked, Ought he not to say what he thinks, whether you and I forbid him or not? I presume, then, that you are going to make one of the interdicted answers. I dare say that I may, notwithstanding the danger, if upon reflection I approve of any of them. But what if I give you an answer about justice other and better, he said, than any of these? What do you deserve to have done to you? All right, so here Thrasymachus is going to, after a little more talking, give his definition of justice, which um, for the next couple of pages gets kind of torn apart. Done to me. As becomes the ignorant, I must learn from the wise. That is what I deserve to have done to me. What? And no payment? A pleasant notion. I will pay when I have the money, I replied. But you have, Socrates said Glaucon, and you, Thrasymachus, need to be under no anxiety about money, for we will all make a contribution for Socrates. Yes, he replied, and then Socrates will do as he always does, refuse to answer himself, but take and pull to pieces the answer of someone else. Why, my good friend, I said, how can anyone answer who knows and says that he knows just nothing, and who, even if he has some faint notions of his own, Oh, this is also really important. Um, Socrates, oh boy, yeah, this could go on for a while. I, I'm not going to. Um, the backstory of this, and you learn this in his, um, I don't know why I can't think of the, the name of the dialogue. Um, let me look real quick. Here, I've got it. Um, uh, the Apology. I don't know why that took a while, but in his Apology, he explains his backstory, and he says that there was an oracle who said that Socrates was the wisest man that ever lived. And Socrates hears this and says, that's not possible. So he goes on this quest to find people who are wiser than him and ultimately finds out that um, while he may not be uh, particularly wise, he may not know a whole bunch of stuff, he's actually wiser in that he is aware of his ignorance. So that's, what's come, that's, what, um, that's what they're talking about here. Uh, how can anyone who answers... Uh, anyone answer who knows and says that he knows just nothing. So Socrates is admitting, I don't really know what I'm talking about, but neither do you. Told by a man of authority not to utter them. 
the natural thing is that the speaker should be some one like yourself who professes to know and can tell what he knows will you then kindly answer for the edification of the company and of myself glaucon and the rest of the company joined in my request and thrasymachus as any one might see was in reality eager to speak for he thought that he had an excellent answer and would distinguish himself but at first he affected to insist on my answering at length he consented to begin behold he said the wisdom of socrates he refuses to teach himself and goes about learning of others to whom he never even says thank you that i learn of others i replied is quite true but that i am ungrateful i wholly deny money i have none and therefore i pay in praise which is all i have and how ready i am to praise any one who appears to me to speak well you will very soon find out when you answer for i expect that you will answer well listen then he said i proclaim that justice is nothing else than the interest of the stronger all right there we go this is the definition we're going to be working with for the rest of the book justice is the interest of the stronger is justice just whatever the person who has the, the most swords or guns or can hit people the hardest is it basically the rules made by the strong or is justice something different now socrates is going to argue against this but they're going to bolster this argument for about another book maybe like 20 or 30 pages they're going to keep bolstering this argument and then socrates is going to have to counter it and that's what the republic is really about and now why do you not praise me but of course you won't let me first understand you i replied justice as you say is the interest of the stronger what thrasymachus is the meaning of this you cannot mean to say that because polydamus the pancratius is stronger than we are and finds the eating of beef conducive to his bodily strength a pancratius is a boxer so he's saying um you know this one guy is really strong he's good at you know he's he's strong um therefore you know he's going to be able to uh you know I, I, he's he's going to be be able to make the rules going to be more just that to eat beef is therefore equally for our good who are weaker than he is and right and just for us that's abominable of you socrates you take the words in the sense which is most damaging to the argument not at all my good sir i said i am trying to understand them and i wish that you would be a little clearer well he said have you never heard that forms of government differ there are tyrannies and there are democracies and there are aristocracies yes i know and the government is the ruling power in each state certainly and the different forms of government make laws democratical aristocratical tyrannical with a view to their several interests and these laws which are made by them for their own interests are the justice which they deliver to their subjects and him who transgresses them they punish as a breaker of the law and unjust and that is what okay so here we're talking about the fact that typically people in power make rules and the people in power are making rules typically to benefit the people in power so he's saying that if you're an autocrat if you're a dictator of a state you're not going to make rules because you really care about the people that you're governing you're going to make rules to make you happy so you know there'll be lots of taxes you won't have to really do anything um people will have to go fight for you that sort of thing and that's the argument that he's going to be maintaining f uh, for you know the what i mean when i say that in all states there is the same principle of justice which is the interest of the government and as the government must be supposed to have power the only reasonable conclusion is that everywhere there is one principle of justice which is the interest of the stronger now i understand you i said and whether you are right or not i will try to discover but let me remark that in defining justice you have yourself used the word interest which you forbade me to use it is true however that in your definition the words of the stronger are added a small addition you must allow he said great or small never mind about that 
we must first inquire whether what you are saying is the truth. Now, we are both agreed that justice is interest of some sort, but you go on to say, of the stronger. About this addition I am not so sure, and must therefore consider further. Proceed. I will. And first tell me, do you admit that it is just for subjects to obey their rulers? I do. But are the rulers of states absolutely infallible, or are they sometimes liable to err? To be sure, he replied, they are likely to err. Then, in making their laws, they may sometimes make them rightly and sometimes not? True. When they make them rightly, they make them agreeable to their interest. When they are mistaken, contrary to their interest. You admit that? Yes. And the laws which they make must be obeyed by their subjects, and that is what you call justice? Doubtless. Then justice, according to your argument, is not only obedience to the interest of the stronger, but the reverse. What is that you are saying? he asked. I am only repeating what you are saying, I believe. But let us consider. Have we not admitted that the rulers may be mistaken about their own interest in what they command, and also that to obey them is justice? Has not that been admitted? Yes then you must also have acknowledged justice not to be for the interest of the stronger, when the rulers intentionally command things to be done which are to their own injury. For if, as you... So here he's saying that basically a ruler can make a rule, can make a law, that's actually harmful to him. And now even if he's trying to help himself and he does this, he's sort of, um, he's sort of failing and he's not doing it. So this is... Uh, something that will come up a little later, but it is, um, just keep that in mind. You say, justice is the obedience which the subject renders to their commands. In that case, O oh, wisest of men, is there any escape from the conclusion that the weaker are commanded to do not what is for the interest, but what is for the injury of the stronger? Nothing can be clearer, Socrates, said Polymarchus. Yes, said Clytophon, interposing, if you are allowed to be his witness. But there is no need of any witness, said Polymarchus, for Thrasymachus himself acknowledges that rulers may sometimes command what is not for their own interest, and that for subjects to obey them is justice. Yes, Polymarchus, Thrasymachus said that for subjects to do what was commanded by their rulers is just. Yes, Clytophon, but he also said that justice is the interest of the stronger, and while admitting both these propositions, he further acknowledged that the stronger may command the weaker, who are his subjects, to do what is not for his own interest. Whence follows that justice is the injury quite as much as the interest of the stronger. But, said Clytophon, he meant by the interest of the stronger what the stronger thought to be his interest. This is what the weaker had to do, and this was affirmed by him to be justice. Those were not his words, rejoined Polymarchus. All right, here coming up, we're going to have Thrasymachus making a, um, a, a kind of important clarification. He's going to be saying, uh, because this is significant to the argument later, he's going to be saying that if we're talking about these things in ideals, like if we're talking about justice as justice, then the idea that there could be mistakes is sort of irrelevant. So we're saying that the person who is truly just is going to be truly just. He's going to do his just stuff really well. And when he fails to do it well, he's not actually being just. He's being something else. And the same with injustice. If someone is really unjust, and he, so he's really going to do those things that he sets out to do. And if he fails, it's not because injustice is failing. It's because this person isn't really living up to the, to the name. Never mind, I replied. If he now says that they are, let us accept his statement. "'Tell me, Thrasymachus,' I said, "'did you mean by justice what the stronger thought to be his interest, whether really so or not?' Well, "'Certainly not,' he said. "'Do you suppose that I call him who is mistaken the stronger at the time when he is mistaken?' "'Yes,' I said. "'My impression was that you did so, when you admitted that the ruler was not infallible, but might be sometimes mistaken.' "'You argue like an informer, Socrates.' Do you mean, for example, that he who is mistaken about the sick is a physician in that he is mistaken, 
or that he who errs in arithmetic or grammar is an arithmetician or grammarian at the time when he is making the mistake in respect of the mistake true we say that the physician or arithmetician or grammarian has made a mistake but this is only a way of speaking for the fact is that neither the grammarian nor any other person of skill ever makes a mistake in so far as he is what his name implies they none of them err unless their skill fails them and then they cease to be skilled artists no artist or sage or ruler errs at the time when he is what his name implies though he is commonly said to err and i okay so he's saying that if they make a mistake they're not what they are so a doctor who messes up a surgery isn't being a doctor at the time he messes it up he's failing to be a doctor so that's the that's the distinction they're making here adopted the common mode of speaking but to be perfectly accurate since you are such a lover of accuracy we should say that the ruler in so far as he is a ruler is unerring and being unerring always commands that which is for his own interest and the subject is required to execute his commands and therefore as i said at first and now repeat justice is the interest of the stronger indeed thrasymachus and do i really appear to you to argue like an informer certainly he replied and do you suppose that i ask these questions with any design of injuring you in the argument nay he replied suppose is not the word i know it but you will be found out and by sheer force of argument you will never prevail i shall not make the attempt my dear man but to avoid any misunderstanding occurring between us in future let me ask in what sense do you speak of a ruler or stronger whose interest as you were saying he being the superior it is just that the inferior should execute is he a ruler in the popular or in the strict sense of the term in the strictest of all senses he said and now cheat and play the informer if you can i ask no quarter at your hands but you never will be able never and do you imagine i said that i am such a madman as to try and cheat thrasymachus i might as well shave a lion why he said you made the attempt a minute ago and you failed enough i said of these civilities it would be better that i should ask you a question is the physician taken in that strict sense of which you were speaking a healer of the sick or a maker of money all right here's another another distinction another way that they're going to get at this argument um he takes a a thing and he he divides it into two s different senses so he's talking about a doctor and he says is a doctor someone who heals the sick or is a doctor someone who makes money now you know th that's a hard distinction to make because you know typically doctors are making money and they're healing sick people but when he breaks these two things apart he's going to force thrasymachus into uh into a corner where he makes uh he makes some mistakes later on in the argument so i guess you know strictly a doctor can be a doctor and make no money but um when thrasymachus makes that uh claim make uh yields in that part of the argument he's gonna get uh, he's gonna get beat up and remember that i am now speaking of the true physician a healer of the sick he replied and the pilot that is to say the true pilot is he a captain of sailors or a mere sailor a captain of sailors the circumstance that he sails in the ship is not to be taken into account neither is he to be called a sailor the name pilot by which he is distinguished has nothing to do with sailing but is significant of his skill and of his authority over the sailors very true he said now i said every art has an interest certainly for which the art has to consider and provide yes that is the aim of art and the interest of any art is the perfection of it this and nothing else what do you mean i mean what i may illustrate negatively by the example of the body suppose you were to ask me whether the body is self-sufficing or has wants i should reply certainly the body has wants for the body may be ill and require to be cured and has therefore interests to which the art of medicine ministers and this is the origin and intention of medicine as you will acknowledge am i right quite right 
he replied. But is the art of medicine, or any other art, faulty or deficient in any quality, in the same way that the eye may be deficient in sight, or the ear fail of hearing, and therefore requires another art to provide for the interests of seeing and hearing? Has art in itself, I say, any similar liability to fault or defect, and does every art require another supplementary art to provide for its interests, and that another and another without end? Or have the arts to look only after their own interests? Or have they no need either of themselves or of another? Having no faults or defects, they have no need to correct them, either by the exercise of their own art or of any other. They have only to consider the interest of their subject matter. For every art remains pure and faultless while remaining true, that is to say, while perfect and unimpaired. Take the words in your precise sense, and tell me whether I am not right. Okay, so that was a bit of a confusing section, but what he's getting at here is that each of the arts, uh, and when he says arts, he's talking about, um, so he, I mean, he uses the example of medicine, but he might use the example of, you know, building a house or fixing a, you know, driving a boat. I don't really know. But um, their their consideration is the thing that they're doing. So your, your guy who, your, your doctor is supposed to be fixing bodies so he's fixing bodies and that's his job however he might also make money he might also have uh, you know an office that he has to keep up whatever and so socrates is making this distinction because when we look at these arts in the strictest sense um, they're not doing two things and this is going to link back to injustice and justice because a just person is only concerned with justice and doing just things not with um you know, bettering himself or, or making money or the advantage of the stronger, as Thrasymachus says in his little thing. Yes, clearly. Then medicine does not consider the interest of medicine, but the interest of the body. True, he said. Nor does the art of horsemanship consider the interests of the art of horsemanship, but the interests of the horse. Neither do any other arts care for themselves, for they have no needs. They care only for that which is the subject of their art. True, he said. But surely, Thrasymachus, the arts are the superiors and rulers of their own subjects. To this he assented with a good deal of reluctance. Then, I said, no science or art considers or enjoins the interest of the stronger or superior, but only the interest of the subject and the weaker. He made a... Now here again there might be some you know, some fast and loose he's playing with these words because he's comparing a just person to a doctor or to, um, where is this now, a pilot um, or a horsemanship, a horse person who takes care of horses. Um, and, you know, in each of those examples, you know, a guy, someone who takes care of horses has to worry about the horse. A doctor has to worry about the patient. Um, and the, uh, the, the pilot has to worry about the boat and getting it across the sea. Uh, but a just person doesn't really have um, that, that sort of relationship um, always with the, with the object of justice. So keep an eye on that. It, it, it may be significant, it may not. But just, you know, as we look at these arguments, realize that there is some, you know, uh, intellectual dishonesty in, in parts of them an attempt to contest this proposition also, but finally acquiesce. Then, I continued, no physician, in so far as he is a physician, considers his own good and what he prescribes, but the good of his patient. For the true physician is also a ruler having the human body as a subject, and he is not a mere money-maker. That has been admitted. And this is getting at the argument that Thrasymachus is making that justice is the advantage of the stronger. And he's going to say, well, if the physician is not interested in his own benefit but the benefit of his patient, then the just person is not going to be interested in his own benefit but in justice. Yes. And the pilot, likewise, in the strict sense of the term, is a ruler of sailors and not a mere sailor. That has been admitted. And such a pilot and ruler will provide and prescribe for the interest of the sailor who is under him and not for his own or the ruler's interest. He gave a reluctant yes. Then, I said, Thrasymachus, 
there is no one in any rule who, in so far as he is a ruler, considers or enjoins what is for his own interest, but always what is for the interest of his subject, or suitable to his art. To that he looks, and that alone he considers in everything which he says and does. All right, that is the first half of book one. And kind of to bring us up to speed, if you've made it this far, we've gone through a couple different versions of justice. And the one that we left off off with was uh, Thrasymachus, who was saying that justice is the advantage of the stronger. And now that uh, this sort of um, stream of dialogue ends here, and we're going to be picking up on... um, um, well, it doesn't end right here, but it's you know that's sort of the first uh, the first part of uh, of that section. Thrasymachus is going to talk for a little bit longer, and then we're going to get his argument picked up by Glaucon and Polymarchus, and they're going to bolster it. They're going to make it even stronger than it was th- in the, in the mouth of Thrasymachus, and it's this bolstered argument that Socrates is going to be fighting against for the rest of the rest of the dialogue. And now we're only in book one, so we have nine more books of dealing with this specific argument of justice, whether justice is the advantage of the person who's the strongest or whether justice is something else. And they're going to try to define justice throughout the rest of this book as well. So um, so that's where we're leaving off. We've done the first half of book one, and next time we're going to be on the second half of book one. And um, if there are any questions as you, uh, maybe if, you, if you're watching this after it's live, uh, shoot the questions in the comments. I'll be sure to address them in the next uh, installment of this. I really hope to go through the entire Republic. This would mean that there will be 20 of these such videos. Um, I don't know if I'm going to actually have time to do all that, but... I hope so because it's a great book and it, it's it's good for me to get uh, to go through it like this and to be able to uh, understand it better myself. So um, thanks for watching, those who have watched, and please stay in tune. Stay tuned for more comment so I can hopefully answer your questions in the next one, and I will see you next time.